The floor. Thank you so much, Pranislav. Uh, let me first check, does this work? Yes, it does. It does, fine, perfect. Well, it's a great honor to be here indeed. And the chairperson has given you a gift. We are finishing early. So I'll not keep you too long, but I hope I have something, as Mr. Gosovic has said, optimistic. Before I reveal the three ideas, let me go back a little step to a crisis that we overcame. <clears throat> we overcame it to such a large extent that it is forgotten. And that was the very real danger of the Cold War escalating into a nuclear confrontation, also in Europe. We had it from 1949 to 1989, the Cold War. It was a Cold War of stupidity, totally unnecessary, could easily have been solved. I'll not go into how right now. I'll only say that one factor saving it was something that we celebrate these days, the 50th anniversary of the Non-Aligned Movement. What did the Non-Aligned Movement decide? They did not go in for anything particularly positive. They just simply say we continue as normal. We refuse to be enrolled in NATO or the Warsaw Treaty Organization. It was headed, of course, by two triangles of countries, Yugoslavia, Kosovic's country, Indonesia, and India, headed by three very profiled leaders, Tito, Skarno, and Nehru. And then one triangle in Europe, also headed by three very profiled leaders, Finland, Sweden and Austria, Kekon, Palme and Kreisky. I mentioned those six names because one characteristic of our situation today is that we are led by dwarfs more than giants. There is an enormous personality crisis on top. I don't think you will find, if you go around the world, more than perhaps one or two people that can match the six names I mentioned. As I mentioned, what they did was to continue the world as normal. And in doing so, they served as in-betweens, non-aligned, as mediators. All six of them played roles of different kinds, very important. And when in 1989 it was all over, to the great relief of millions, billions, it's not the least due to them. It would have been good to have such people with us today and an online movement between the West and Islam. But I'll now address the three crises that I think this conference is addressing one way or the other. Number one, the gap between North and South. Number two, the enormous inequity increasing disparity under neoliberalism all over the world, within and between countries. And number three, global warming, the whole energy problematic. So the idea then is to come up with three ideas. And idea number one has to do with the gap between North and South. And the idea is geographical. Look at the old Silk Road. You have a map in front of you. And you start in Beijing. And you go down the coast to Guangzhou. You have East China involved. It is called the Silk Road because it was not primarily about silk. And it was not a road. What is famous is the inner road, often extremely problematic. Much more important was the sea lane. And the sea lane went through the Malacca Straits. It rounded Sri Lanka. The Maldives were quite important. It touched India and Southeast Asia, of course. 
touched the Middle East and where did it end? It ended in Somalia and south of Somalia onwards toward Dar es Salaam. In other words, it was from East China to East Asia and there it stopped. How long did it last? 1,000 years. From Anno Domini 500 to Anno Domini 1500. The world was Asia in those days, as pointed out in a book by Stuart Gordon, when Asia was the world. A book I cannot enough recommend. I have copies of my talk here for those who would like to have it afterwards. And outside you will find a number of books that deal with corresponding things. So that was history. What's the proposal? The proposal is very simple. Build a four-lane highway from Dar es Salaam to the seaport corresponding to Kinshasa. Uniting Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and the two Congos. At that point, have another big container terminal and go on to Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, Porto Alegre, La Plata, Montevideo. And the eastern part of Latin America is in it. I talked with some people high up in shipping, very high up in shipping. It was very easy for a Norwegian to do. And they say it would be a tremendous advantage from a shipping point of view. Not only because of the distance, but also because of the weather, the climate, the storms, the waves. The two computer, two container terminals is an easy job. But what is more important is not necessarily shipping for trade, but it is a continuous road on which people and ideas could travel. And above all, it's a way of realizing the South as Latin America, Africa, Asia. In that formula, Africa was, practically speaking, always left out. The ships went through the Suez Canal and the Gibraltar Strait, or they went south of Cape de Good Hope. They didn't touch Africa. The planes fly high above all of it. A road of that kind would open up and connect parts of Africa. It would make the possibility of a bioceanic confederation, bioceanic from Atlantic to the Indian Ocean, between the two Congos, Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania, Uganda. And you could also imagine a road that would go higher up from Somalia and touch Nigeria, Ghana. For the Chinese, it would be a small job to build that road. They do it extremely quickly. They have built four-lane highways that are longer than the one through Africa indicated. And I would modestly suggest to the Chinese, give it as a gift to Africa, just simply as a gift. Don't demand anything in return. You are getting so much anyhow. You are so rich anyhow. You are so clever, and your competitive advantage, as I'm coming to in point two, is not cheap labor. It is not resources. It's not the kind of thing economists are stupid enough to talk about. Your competitive advantage is your culture. It's your samfa, the way China combines three civilizations, the Taoist, the Confucian, and the Buddhist. Adds to that Western secularism and a couple of other things and drawn the best from all of them. When you do that, you don't do the stupidity of the West that also is based on three civilizations, three Abrahamic, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but spending their time with one of them fighting two, two of them fighting one, one fighting all the... In general, fighting each other one way or the other. 